Good morning. How's everybody doing? If you're not awake, you soon will be. I uh, was once told when I worked at Starbucks, I got complaints because I was too cheery in the morning, and people just weren't ready for that. <laughs> well, welcome. So we're going to be talking about overcoming your fear of sales. How many people in here sell something? Yeah, okay. How many people in here hate selling stuff? Right? We've all been there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to make it a little less unpleasant for you and help get, get you out of your own head a little bit. All right. Okay. What's scarier than heights? Sales. <laughs> What's scarier than public speaking? Sales. So, <clears throat> public speaking, it said, is, is scarier than the fear of death, right? What's scarier than that? the fear of rejection right that's really what it comes down to when we're selling and we start getting nervous and a little clammy feeling in our hands we're about to ask for that big dollar amount it's not because we think that this is you know a big monster is going to come and eat us it's because they might hurt our feelings <laughs> right so I'll tell you a little bit about me and why I might know something about sales and the fear of rejection so I've been in sales since I was five years old both of my parents were real estate agents, and they used to practice their listing presentations with me. And I got so good at it because I memorized it. Their broker brought me in to do sales training for all their agents when I was five years old because he wanted them to see how it was done right. <laughs> that didn't go to my head at all. <clears throat> so I've been selling stuff since I was five, and then when I was in fourth grade, my parents got divorced, and I became a raging people pleaser. And if there's, what's the worst thing that can happen to a people pleaser? No. Right? So. But it's not us. When we hear no, it's not about you, right? So let's look at the numbers. 80% of consumers say no the first four times a salesperson talks to them. Not the first four times a bad salesperson talks to them. Any salesperson, okay? Five calls is the number of calls that on average it takes to get a yes. Seventy-two percent of all, say, uh, all cold calls end in rejection. It's not you more than likely, right? So we just have to get used to the idea that most of the time we're going to get a no, not now, ask me later, click, right? It's not personal. But when you've gone through the first four times, the first five calls, the 72%, and you're still getting a no, the number one reason for rejection is your own agenda. Nobody cares what's in it for you. Right? So, so how do we achieve inner sales nirvana? It's all in our heads. Got to, get, got to get your mind right. Has anybody ever said those words? I don't want to bother them. I bet they're really busy right now. It's almost lunchtime. They just got back from lunch. They're probably getting ready to go home. Are you psychic? Right? I'm a little psychic. But that's another discussion, right? <laughs> But really, are you tending to read their minds? Do you really know, or is this your own internal psychodrama playing out and being projected on other people, short-circuiting your own ability to be wildly successful? Listen to your self-talk. So one of the most powerful tools in your toolbox is non-judgmental self-observation. Don't get down on yourself. You are where you are. There's nothing we can do about this moment right here except observe it, right? And if you observe this moment and how you act, there's going to be some really interesting things that come up. You're going to say to yourself, oh, I didn't realize I did that. Well, isn't it interesting that I made that excuse? Isn't it interesting the way I did that? And you start observing yourself and you can plan to make better decisions in your conversations. <coughs> Are you playing credit manager? Has anybody ever heard of this? 
So I, I've sold a lot of things. I've sold alarms and stained glass windows and above ground pools and I mean everything you can think of. I've, I've tried to sell it. One time I was selling above ground pools and I drove up to the sales appointment. My sales manager had set it for me. He knew the story. I didn't. I drove up cold. Ramshackle house on the side of a mountain. Walked out. Old dude in overalls. No shirt. In the front yard. I'm sitting in my car. I call my sales manager. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Did you really just waste my time? He's like, what are you talking about? I said, this guy can't afford a $5,000 pool. And he said, you're playing credit manager and that's not your job. So, what do you mean? He said, it's not your job to determine another person's finances and what they can afford. In fact, it's quite insulting. Do you do that in your business? I know that I continually have to remind myself that I'm not a credit manager for somebody else. Their finances are not my business. Have you ever gone into a sales call and you said, well, I know to be really profitable, I need to charge this, but they probably can't afford that, so I'm going to tell them this. You're playing credit manager, right? That's not our job. Did he buy the pool? What's that? Did the old buy the pool? Yeah. You know why? Because what he was buying was not a pool. He was buying seeing his wife in a bikini for the next three months. <laughs> right? He didn't care about clothes. He didn't care about a nice house. But he cared about seeing her in a two-piece from June to August. Right? It's not about what we want. I wanted to sell him a pool. And all that psychodrama in my head was about my needs. I didn't take a second to think about what might be in it for him. I was thinking more about how this interaction affected me. Nobody has ever sat in their car before a sales call or a client appointment and had all a bunch of crazy thoughts about how they're going to serve a client's needs. Right? All that stuff that's going on is because you're in your own head thinking about yourself. Well, that's how it applies to me. I don't want to make assumptions about you. But more than likely, if you're having anxious conversations in your head, before you interact with somebody, it's more likely you're focusing inward. Have you done this enough, or is every single time like the first time? Right? Do you think that the lady at the drive through at McDonald's has sales fear when she's asking you to supersize your fries? No, because she does it 700 times a day, right? Okay, now let's, let's apply that. I mean, if you want to get comfortable with sales, if you want to get comfortable with sales conversations, you have to have them. And you have to have them frequently and, and with repetition. <clears throat> want some good news? It's better than French fries. Your job is not to sell. Right? Your job is to solve problems for people. That's a completely different mental dynamic and conversational dynamic, right? Hopefully the problems you're solving are not as bad as the problems this guy solves, but <laughs> solving problems is our job. Well, who are you going to solve problems for? Not everybody in the known universe, right? The more clear you get about who your target market is, the more clear you can get about how you can be the expert in solving their problem. I used to think that my target market was the people I built websites for, right? That seems logical. But the more I dug down into my why, I realized that my target market are my referral partners. That's who I want to spend time with. That's who I want to craft my messages for. That's who I want to solve problems for. And in the end, everybody gets what they want. <clears throat> they need a trusted guide, a trusted advisor who can walk with them. Bless his heart. He just looks lost, right? <laughs> to be a trusted advisor, one of the things you want to get to know is what's going on in their business. 
How can you solve a problem or build a website or um, create a marketing automation or write content when you don't understand what their business is and what their pain points are? One of my greatest business relationships came from asking somebody who was sitting next to me at a meetup, were you struggling in your business? And he said, I really hate X. And I said, me too. But why don't you let me, but I said that in my head. <laughs> I was like, why don't you help, let me help you solve that pain. You take that off your plate. Find out what they didn't like from people they don't buy from. All right. I went on a recent sales call. The guy was a referral. And he, I was the sixth web agency he had talked to that week. And he was angry and he was bitter and he did not like that I was wasting his time. Okay, that could be a red flag or it could be an opportunity. You need some clarifying questions to find out which that is. So I asked him, I said, I see that, you know, this has been a very unpleasant experience for you and I'm sorry about that. But can you tell me what was the commonality of all these people that you talked to that you didn't like? And he said, they didn't hustle and they didn't know how to communicate. Okay, all right. Well, and he was really curmudgeonly, so I didn't ask this question ironically. I said, have you ever worked with anybody you did like? And he said, yes, dozens and dozens. And I said, well, what's the commonality between all of them? He said, they hustle and they know how to communicate. Oh, what do you think I talked about for the next hour? Yes, because when they're agitated, this is an opportunity to either pre-qualify them as not a good candidate for your business or find out how you can be a superstar to them. And once you know their story, you get to talk, but not about what you want you bend your story to their concerns. So what this gentleman needed was a website, but what he was buying was hustle and communication. So as I crafted my story to fit his concerns, that's what I talked about, how fast we were gonna get this done, how we were gonna communicate every step of the way. That's a different experience than just trying to sell somebody a product, right? I needed to sell that old dude in overalls and no shirt, three months with his wife in a bikini, not an above ground pool. So one of the things that short circuits our ability to do sales effectively is our own perception of what sales means, right? So when people hear sales, sometimes they think sleazy, greasy, cheesy, smarmy, you know? Hucksterish. Well, there are some classic sales techniques. They've gotten a bad rap over the year, years, some of them. But let's see what we can do to update them for the digital age and maybe apply them to a more elegant sales process. Going out of business. Has anybody ever seen this sign? <laughs> we had a carpet company in our neighborhood when I was a kid who went out of business every three weeks. What's this about, right? What is that? That is scarcity. Updated for the digital age, I'm booking up quickly. You know, I only have two more slots available and I'd love for one of those to be yours. Get back to me because that's a moving target. My booking calendar is one of my best friends in my sales process because it's very clear I don't have a lot of available slots. That promotes scarcity, okay? Anybody else use scarcity in their business? Allison. Yeah, well, I plan to. I've got a plan because I am finally booked up months in advance to say it on social media. I've got one spot available for July. Who wants it? I'm booking up quickly. Very and effective. I do this, but I feel like I'm doing it because I'm very excited to do it. Yes, <laughs> right? You have to do the act. Visualization is the first step, right? Because you have to own it in your mind. Anybody else? Bobby. Um, I've got a client who's been sitting on a proposal for weeks. Mm. I've had other clients come, come in and say, hey, I'm ready. So I'm planning on just letting you know, this, you know th there's an 
an expiration date on this proposal. Yes. And we, you know, either you jump on board or you know, you're going to have to find somebody else. Do you put an expiration date in your proposal? No. I don't either, but I have made a resolution that I'm going to start doing that. Because, especially if you use like an electronic proposal solution, if you don't put an expiration date, you can be booked up for three weeks and then somebody sits, sends, accept on a two-week turnaround project and now you're like, oh! Yeah. So it's not always about creating scarcity, but sometimes it's about managing your own time. Foot in the door. So I might be dating myself. Some of the younger folks in the room probably have never seen this. When I was a kid, door-to-door -door salesmen would come around, and if you open the door, they'd put their foot in. So you had to hear what they said or break his foot, right? <clears throat> well, we don't want to do that, but what would be an updated version of this for the digital age? Opt-ins. Opt Trip wires. What else? Yeah, ethical bribes. <laughs> That's what they're called. Ah, thank you for asking. A tripwire product is a small product that you can sell to start building trust and value in your relationship. Is that right? the same as a lead magnet? Well, normally no. Normally a lead magnet is an ethical bribe where you are saying, if you'll sign up for my list, I'll give you this, right? So where a tripwire would be, once they're on your list, maybe you send out an email and say, hey, I normally charge X for this, but for a limited time, I'm going to give you this one thing for $99, you know, something that's a very small fraction of your normal thing, right? So when I sell a website, it's several, several thousands of dollars, but I really like to sell keyword research as a trip, tripwire product. It's a, it's a small engagement. It, you have lots of interaction with the client up front. You get to know them. You get to build trust with them. And they get to see my expertise, right? And then once they have that keyword research, I'm pushing them through to take them where they need to go. This is a foundational product. I'd love for you to get started on this. Okay. It's easier than just a cold sale for a $5,000 website, right? Another tried and true classic. What about now? What about now? Knock, 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 knock. I, I noticed you hadn't opened my email since yesterday at 5 p.m. Are you okay? <laughs> Updated for the digital age. Continuing to demonstrate not only the prospect's value to you, right, because they don't care what their value to you is, really, but also your value to them, right? So maybe every touch point that you have with them is not a sales call. Maybe some of your touch points is you have a particular problem. I ran across this article, and I thought you would be interested. Talk to you later. No ask, nothing. All you're doing is giving and providing value. Nobody wants to be around somebody. Have you ever been around a friend who is just a taker? <coughs> Have you ever been on a date with somebody who never shut up? <laughs> right? This relationship is like a romance between your business and their business. Right? The most important way that you can make someone else feel like they are heard and you were a great conversationalist, it's not to say anything, really. To listen to them. Give them an opportunity. He who talks first loses. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, for those of you who haven't heard what this is, this is a sales technique that basically says that when I have a conversation with you and we're gonna, I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question and it's probably around money, budget, timeline, milestones, things that benefit me. The human propensity is to feel that silence when you're waiting for an answer with anything. Okay. A lower number, lesser terms, 
to reduce your position of strength in any way to get out of having to sit there with your own problems for five seconds while you wait for the other person to answer. Okay? Because the person who, person who talks first loses. I mean, your client doesn't really lose, but if you talk first, you do. Okay? This is so powerful. I would be willing to say, if you could learn to sit in silence, you could probably increase your sales by 20% next year, just by doing that. You imagine all the lost sales, billions and billions of dollars of lost sales and generated income from people who just can't sit with themselves for a few seconds. It's really powerful. Updated for the digital age? Still gold. Right? This one still works. What are some other old school techniques you've seen? He who talks first still loses. Updated for the digital age. It doesn't need to be updated. It still works. What are some other old school techniques you've seen? What about bait and switch? Anybody ever seen that? We used to do that at the pool company. We said, we have an above ground pool, it's $395. The year before I came on, they got in big trouble because they would not, if somebody said, yeah, I'll buy that pool, they were like, we're out of stock, but we have this $5,000 model. <laughs> That's bait and switch, right? But how can we take that principle and ethically update that, right? How about we have a templated website or we have a custom website for X amount of dollars and we get them interested in a conversation and we say, yes, we can do that for you, but this might be a better solution considering your very particular needs. Your mileage may vary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things I do is when someone is doing a recurring plan, if they get over a certain amount, it triggers a free service, right? Anybody else? What are some other common obstacles that you face in selling? Yes. So when someone comes back with an objection on price, it's really just a few things that they're re that's really happening. One, they don't have any money, and they're, and they're not a good fit for your business, and that's a pre-qualifying issue, right? So now you know, okay, maybe I haven't completely refined my process of onboarding people through my sales process, and I need to, like, work on that, right? Or it could be that during your conversation, you haven't given them enough information, right? So maybe you haven't shown them all the value that they have because by the time you get to the end of your sales conversation, if it's all about them and you've identified what their problem is, and maybe the problem they told you they have is not their real problem, right? So you got to do some probing questions, clarifying, probe and clarify, probe and clarify. And if you finally got into the real problem and you have created an awesome, you know, solution to their problem and it's still a question of price, maybe they're not the only decision maker. Have you ever heard some of, that sounds great, got to talk to my wife. Mm. So asking who's the decision maker, who all are the decision makers on this project? It's a great, just, these are some of my onboarding questions I'd like to ask up front, you know, what's the nature of your business? What's your structure of your business? What do you sell? Who are the decision makers? Just slip it in there, right? And then it may be that you're, and this is probably the least likely situation, is that your pricing 
may be incorrect, right? Maybe you need to test a few. And maybe it's not off by that much, but maybe if your um, product is $8,000, maybe the magic number is 7,775, but you don't know until you've done some testing, right? Usually that's not it, but occasionally it is. Yes, sir. Yes, that is, that is absolutely correct. So if you reduce your pricing without taking something off the table, you've told them a couple of things. One, I was overpricing you to begin with. Two, I have no pricing integrity, and every price I give you from now on is subject to negotiation. Never, ever lower your prices unless, one, your lights are about to get turned off. <laughs> Two, you're taking something off the table. All right. Has anybody ever gone all the way through their sales process, gone all the way through, put all this time in, sat down with a client, got all the way to the end, and then didn't ask for the business? Mm. It's very common. It's very common. Make sure that you're practicing telling somebody you want their business. Right? I only have two slots available. I'd love for one of them to be yours. You know, this is a great solution. I am so excited about working with you. I really would like to do business with you. It's a little scary because then they could say, well, I don't like you and you're ugly. Because we're scared of rejection, right? Hey, I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. It may be, but it also may be expanding the complexity of your process because then if they haven't decided enough to pull the trigger, you may have to give them their money back. Oh, good point. You know? I mean, so you might want to test it and see how that works for you. Do you get a deposit before they get on your schedule? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a way, you know, for them to go ahead and put some skin in the game. Um, but I like that about the slots. I think I'll try that before the other two. That would be a lot more work. Yeah, and also maybe try to think of a smaller engagement, a really tiny engagement that you can book that slot for. Maybe it's a half-day workshop, you know, and then but it's, you're booking the slot, getting them to pay you for your consulting, because especially if you're doing a large proposal, that's a service you're providing them because you are helping them work through their business processes. They don't know what they need to buy, and you're the professional coming in beside them, helping them determine what it is their business needs. That has value. Sue. So. Mm. You may be at Starbucks for an hour and can we review this and then I'll decide if I want to hire you. Well, I gave away probably hundreds of hours and lots of money. So what I do now is a 15 minute free phone thing. And after that, the meter's on. Mm -hmm. Go here and sign up for an hour of my time for 100 bucks or when you're ready, pay me to come meet with yeah. you because you know what? I, I've given away so much and I think that's, again, we don't have an organized process. Yeah. Yeah, so I recently had a situation where a client came to me by referral and um, I had a great sales call with them. My, my initial calls are usually around 45 minutes to an hour and I have a very high closing rate on my first calls, right? It's because I, I can just really dig into their clarifying and probing, right? But we had a great call, sent them a proposal, 
It wasn't a big thing. I didn't need to go on site. Thought it was a lock. They call me back and they say, hey, we've got this other company who's come in with a lower price. They're going to do this, this, and this. Can you work with me on that? And I said, when I replied back, I said, I have to be very careful how I answer this because there's a fine line between clarifying my position and auditioning for work. And I want to do the former and not the latter. Has anybody ever danced for business? I'll do anything. <laughs> Me too, I've done it. It's a constant battle to keep yourself in check. But we don't need to do that because we are the experts. When you start dancing, you give them the power. And now you become a, a hired pencil for them. Which is not to their benefit. They need an expert, not somebody they can boss around. Because then you're going to end up doing what they want, and they'll, ne they'll never respect you, and they'll never take your advice, and then you're going to end up with a piece of crap product that you're responsible for, and now they're unhappy. But people respect strength. That, that email that I sent back, and I said, let me just clarify my position. They emailed back, and they, were sa they said, thank you so much for being transparent. I really appreciate that, and we're probably going to go with you. Right? Because it's not always about price, it's about perception. Chris. So, if I actually uh, support salespeople, which if you don't do that, that's an exciting kind of life. <laughs> um, and the group that I support, I, I work for a large publisher, and I help them put together proposals, like customized proposals that go to their school district clients. So, one of the things that I have is my list of clarifying questions when they want to ask me for a proposal. And of course, everything was yesterday, or perhaps last week, bless their hearts, and I have to ask a few questions. So one of my questions is, what is the value of what you're doing, and what is your next, what's, what's the, the date of your next meeting with the client? Mm -hmm. And those two questions alone can make them evaporate. Because what they wanted was just something they would have in their hip pocket for that client. I don't have the luxury of love. But I realize that when you're talking about these uh, these specific clarifying questions, that I'm doing that every day. And if I want this other business to take off my personal business, then I can use those same techniques, which is really nice. But simply asking, what is your timeline? And straight up, what is this work to you? Mm -hmm. Allows me to make a whole lot of decisions that otherwise I would Absolutely, absolutely. I'm an introvert, but I am not shy, right? Those are not the same thing. So I just ask people, do you have an allocated budget for this? Because the last thing you want is to get all the way through the sales process and they're like, all right, I'm going to talk to my money guy and we'll work out payment. Whoa. That means you don't have the money for this. And my final payment might be contingent on this third person who I've never met liking what we did, even though he had no input in the process. And sometimes to that answer is, I don't know what my budget is. Okay. People don't know what their budget is, but they know what their budget's not. <laughs> well, how much is that website? Um, well, I will say that again. Maybe you don't know what your budget is, but is your budget $15,000? No, I was thinking more $4,700. Boom. Okay, now we've got some clarification. <laughs> It's a sneaky trick, isn't it? <laughs> Heather? So you said about you know, people not asking you for the business and not you know, closing when it's the right time to close. I think the other thing is that people, when you have that 15 minute conversation, you have that hour meeting at Starbucks or whatever, like every interaction that you have, you should have an objective. You should have some sort of conversion point that you're trying to get them to mm -hmm. Right. Until the very end. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So what Heather was saying is that at every interaction we should be moving forward to a goal, right? So maybe your sales cycle is a little bit longer than mine. 
right? Maybe your sales cycle is there's a lot of trust building and it's a big project and, we, and it takes a long time to make a decision. But at each step of the way, we could be moving a little bit forward and there needs to be goals along with that, right? So incremental success and then that final piece kind of just locks into place instead of just cruising and then having a big ask, right? Yes. Okay, so they said that they're ready to go. Yeah. How, so your client who referred you, are they qualified to make that assessment that this person is ready to go? Right? Yeah. So, they, and, and you've never met them. They might not be a fit for you. I take almost everybody that comes through referral for me, you know, to me, because that's a really important thing. I will find a solution because I want to make my, my main job is not to build websites. My main job is to make my referral partners look like geniuses for referring them to me. That's my job, right? Okay, so when they emailed me and said, because it was an email, not a call. And they said, hey, this other company has come in under price. And they said they can do the exact same things you can do for $400 less, let's just say. Which was about a 20% difference in this initial engagement. So I do not compete on price, right? Because you're never, it's never apples to apples. So I reminded her, and she was like, and can you give me some referrals? <laughs> I said, once we have agreed upon an engagement, I'd be more than willing to introduce you to one of my clients, but my relationships with my clients are sacred to me. I do not expose them to strangers, and I would extend you the same courtesy. And as far as this other company, I am local, they are not. I have offered to come on site and learn about your business and how I can craft a custom solution for you. If they are also willing to do that and you feel that they're gonna give you the same service and the person who referred them to you is the same caliber as the person that referred me to you, then I wish you luck and I will bear no ill will because I think you've probably made a better decision, really. I'm not always the best person. I might have been being a little sarcastic. <laughs> but they got the point, right? Because they forgot that I'd come, by, I'd come highly recommended, and they got distracted by price. So I just brought them back. But it's not about me. I'm not saying. I never once said, I'm, because I have more skills in this area than they do. It was all about... Are they going to give you the same level of service and value? Do you respect where you got the information about them? Right? All about them. Yes, sir. How do you go about asking for referrals? When someone is wildly happy at the end of a first engagement and they're like, oh my God! <laughs> do you know anybody else? who you could introduce me to, you know? Would you mind saying exactly what you just said on Yelp? You know what I mean? Sending them an email saying, you know, thank you so much for all the kind words. You know, the biggest compliment you could pay me is to say that on social media. But the majority of my referrals, now I do get a lot of referrals from my clients, but the majority of my referrals come from my peers. And I think the majority of your referrals can come from your peers as well. I have a talk on WordPress TV called Building Your Referral Network. I recommend if you want to build your referrals, go check that out. Building Your Referral Network. You have to just search my name. I before the E. <laughs> that weird. Hi, Jen. Mm. 
Yes, because when somebody refers somebody to you, they're lending you their reputation. And unless you close that loop, there's still a little anxiety. I don't want any, that's not a, a, an appealing position to be in, right? Yeah, it's not. No, I appreciate it. Yes, Bobby. I was, was going to say, like, I've had the opposite experience <laughs> where I've sent somebody to someone else and then I got a response like, oh, well, I just never contacted them. <laughs> And uh, that was the last time that person got a referral from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, if you want referrals, make it a great experience for the people referring business to you. You would think that that's a no-brainer, but, right? Because there's nothing better than business dropping in your lap. And not only is that easier to acquire the prospects, it's an easier sales process. They're already loved up when they get to you. All right? All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, there's a fourth option. One of the best things I ever heard at a WordPress meetup came from Diana Nichols, and I don't know if you know her. She's down at the registration desk. She, she said these magic words to me. That's a fantastic thing to put on our itinerary for phase two. <laughs> <laughs> right? I open a document. I have like a shared Google Drive folder for all of my clients. I just open a document, phase two, and we just start putting stuff on there. And I'm assuming the sale. That's another classic sales technique, assuming the sale. I'm in here, I'm talking to you. My assumption is we're doing business and I'm just gonna start talking to you as if we were. You can do that for phase two. Just start opening it up. This is gonna go so well. Let's just go ahead and start putting our ideas for phase two because we wanna close this out because the last thing we want is just a project that goes on forever. Let's define this and then hit phase two. You just reminded me of, of offering a tier approach and assuming you get to get into sales. Where you can say, you've got this bronze level package, mm -hmm. this, the silver package, or get this or the gold package, where you get this, and then assume the sales, like, which one would you prefer? Is that something that you can Yeah. I, and, and honestly, I don't ask them which one they prefer because they're not the expert I am, right? I will say, these are our options. This is the one I recommend for you. Maybe I say, how would you like to move forward? I'm not even giving them an option not to move forward. I'm just asking them how they want to do it, right? This is how I work. This is my sales process. When someone says, well, I'm really interested how do we move forward? Because sometimes they ask me. And I say, OK, this is my sales process, and this is where I set up all my jerky expectations for them. Because I, can, I like to be like a real hard ass up front, and then once they make that first payment, it's all love and roses after that. <laughs> right? But you, it, this is really important, because you're setting the expectation that you're a value to them. Right? This is how, I, this is how my process works. My next available start date is here. To get on that next available start date, I need a 50% deposit, okay? Once I get the deposit, you go on the calendar. This is your homework. I expect these things to be done before we start, and I will do these things. If we, uh, the project will last, let's just say four weeks. When the project is done, the payment, the final payment is due, and if we're not done, it's because I'm waiting on you because I don't miss deadlines. Okay? Yes. So, yeah. For scheduling, do you use a product like Calendly or an online calendar where people can sign up to speak with you or to meet with you? Or can you explain a little how you use that? Thank you for bringing that up. So I do have an appointment calendar, and you can find it by going to bookwithapril.com. <laughs> where you can book a consultation with me, a let's hang and talk turkey. That's one of my options, right? 
But yes, yes. I just wanted to kind of maybe tie the last two things that were talked about in terms of structuring the money and the scope for you. I used to work for a very large software development company or consulting company, and um, one of the things they always did was establish a change budget up front mm -hmm. and say, look, we're not doing this work for you unless you take 30% of that budget and set it aside for change, because unless you are super, super good at getting all those specifications on the front end, sometimes the scope creep is necessary to finish out the project, but you got to get paid for it. So yes. Combining yes. those two things really good. And I am of the opinion that if I misquote, that's my bad. My client should not pay. If I'm going to be the expert, I have, to take, I have to take the hit if I misquote. But I build in for chaos because chaos is not new and you're not immune from it. It's an element of the universe. So just build it into your proposal. So a lot of people bid for the best case scenario. If everything works out well and everything's perfect, we can get this done on this time frame in this order and it would cost this much and that's what they bid. Where's your allowance for chaos? Right? Because it always happens. Yes. That's a very specific question with a very complicated answer. I do a hybrid. I do fixed price billing. And then if there is like something with a wide degree of ambiguity and potential chaos, then I will do hourly billing. I have a very nice hourly rate. So that doesn't really hurt me. But that's a last resort, right? And I have a rate sheet. Who has a rate sheet? My rate sheet is so powerful. For a long time, I did bespoke pricing. Everyone got a different price based on their current situation. And the credit manager, who thought I knew what they needed, right? So I had to, I had to rein myself in and write it all down and then send it to my assistant and say, keep me accountable for this, right? And the first call I took after I did my rate sheet was just my minimums. And that's all. I didn't put everything I did. I just put my minimums. I'm not going to take anything under X. This is what this process costs, right? The very next phone call, I did not have my rate sheet up. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do it for this. I can do it for this is amateur. This is what it costs. It's professional. That means I have a process. This is not the first time I've done this, right? And also, it allows you to deflect a little responsibility, right? My price sheet's my boss. You can almost kind of play a mental game like, I'd love to give you that discount, but the boss says. Do they see your whole price sheet? Like, do you no. Have This is internal, it's internal and confidential, right? But occasionally a referral partner will ask for my price sheet so they can, if, especially if they're going to bid my prices into their work or they want to know if I'm an appropriate fit. And if we have an established relationship, I will send them my price sheet. Yes, sir. What do you think about publishing prices? I publish a range, so on my website, I say, and I have some, if y'all want to go there later, I have some really jerky language on my website. If you want to work with me, these are the qualifications, right? Because it blows away the people who want to be in charge and attracts the people who like strength and want to respect you, right? But I put a range. I say, I met my minimum for, you know, really my minimum engagement is this. And if you want something more complex, it can go up to this and then increase rapidly from there. <laughs> right? Because it's all about setting expectations because then if they make it through that gate of jerkiness, then they can say, then when you start talking, they're like, oh, okay, well, that's not bad. But I've had more people tell me that I look like the queen of my industry because of my website because I'm a little jerky on it. 
You've got to have money. You have to have a budget. You need a team. You need determination. You need commitment. You need respect for deadlines. Because we're going to do this thing and we're going to do it right and I need you on board if I'm going to make something fantastic for you. And I will. But you've got to play too. Right? Jenny. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are beginning to standardize our processes, right? So that started with my rate sheet. Okay, we're not just going to do whatever. So, and I had an internal process, but it was all in my head. But now I've hired somebody else, and they need to know that too. So now we've got a process. And not only have a process for, for everything that we're putting together, we have a process for onboarding our clients. And once you can onboard your clients in a really strategic way, the quality goes up, right? Pricing is easier, and it's a little bit more fun to sell something when you don't have to do all the work. Think about that. I was suppressing my own ability to sell because I knew I was going to do the work. But what if you didn't have to do that? I don't know. I started talking. Did I answer the question? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. My website is sugar5design.com. <clears throat> you can find all the slides at this ridiculous link. <clears throat> or you can go to my website, go to slides, fear of sales sugar5design.com so it's a landing page that's book like a boss it's a fantastic site um, and but I can um, on my <clears throat> like say under my services I have a drop down for coaching and I have my calendar embedded on my website with also my terms to tell you if you're eligible to book a, an appointment with me. Right? Right? I don't have time for turkeys. But I'm very generous with people who are a fit for me. Right? Well, that's all I have. Thank you.